Hey everybody, my name is Jake Peer, and I hope you're having a great week here at Virtual Camp Canopy. I'm a consulting forester with Helser Woodland Management in Mount Vernon, Ohio. Today I'm going to be talking to you about silviculture. Silviculture is defined as the art and science of growing trees. To me, it's the art and science of growing and managing trees through light manipulation. It's the bread and butter of what a forester does on a day-to-day -day basis, and it's the toolbox that we use to help us help landowners achieve their goals. So if a landowner has a desire to have better wildlife habitat for wild turkey on their property, we're going to implement a silvicultural prescription to help them achieve those goals through timber harvests. Um, it can also work with a variety of goals, whether it be timber production or game species habitat, non-game species habitat for birding, um, even if somebody wants their woods to be purely aesthetically pleasing to them so that they can go on hikes, we can achieve that. Hey everybody, I'm going to start by introducing you to the idea of trees that are shade tolerant versus trees that are shade intolerant. We're going to start talking about this tree right here. You might remember from your dendrology course earlier in the week that this is a black cherry. Um, black cherry is often known as a pioneer species. It loves full sun. It's going to be one of the very first tree species to, to take off and start growing in a reverting field or pasture. Um, oftentimes you'll see black cherry growing with red maple and sassafras and American elm, at least in this part of Ohio. Um, so this is a great example of a tree that is shade intolerant. It has to have sunlight to grow. Um, and I should back up a little bit and say that um, not all trees are the same. So just like when you go to buy flowers for the flower beds in front of your house, some flowers are, um, they require full sun, some like partial sun, some like full shade. It's the same with trees. Um, and as I said, black cherry is one that likes full sun. So I'm gonna walk over here and look at a little bit smaller of a tree. This is a sugar maple. Sugar maple is a great example of a shade tolerant species. Also, I'll go ahead and give you a look at the leaf here just as a recap from your dendrology class. You can see the U-shaped sinuses on the, on the leaf. Um, but anyways, going back to shade tolerance, um, sugar maple and American beech are our two best examples here in, in central, north central Ohio of tree species that are going to grow in full shade. Um, without allowing more sunlight through the canopy to reach the forest floor, we're going to have a lot of sugar maple and a lot of American beech. Um, depending on your goals, that might be fine. But if you're trying to grow oak species, which are um, great for timber production and also great for wildlife, you're not going to do it in a woodland that has a full canopy and you're only growing these sugar maples and American beech in the understory. Next, I'm going to talk about the crown class of a tree. So as you probably know, the crown of the tree is the green leafy part at the top where photosynthesis occurs. Um, the crowns of all the trees in a forest make up the canopy. I'm gonna use that word quite a bit. Um, so the crown class is a way of classifying the trees in the forest to determine how much sunlight they're receiving. Essentially, crown class is the tree's accessibility to sunlight. So I'm standing in front of a black cherry, um, and this is an example of a dominant crown class. So the crown of this tree is above the canopy of the forest. It's receiving sunlight not only on the top of the tree, but also on the sides of, of the crown. Um, I'm gonna walk up and take a look at a, a different tree and show you a co-dominant um, crown class. So this tree is a black walnut, and it is about the same height as all of the other trees in this woods. So it's receiving most of its sunlight on the very top, maybe a little bit on the sides, but it's pretty limited. And again, this is a co-dominant tree. Um, next, we're going to look at an intermediate tree. So that's one that really is just receiving some sunlight on the top of its crown. This black cherry is an example of that. And I know it's, Kind of hard to see, but it's a, a tall spindly tree. It doesn't have a very big um, crown because the trees around it are sucking up most of the sunlight. So the last crown class that we're going to talk about is suppressed. Um, different trees respond differently to suppression. Um, like I mentioned earlier, a sugar maple can 
live for years and years being suppressed. This is a hickory right here, um, and it is suppressed, meaning that its crown is receiving very, very little sunlight. The crowns of all these other trees are above it. So a suppressed tree is below the canopy of the woods. Um, hickory likes quite a bit of sun. So unless some of these um, larger trees around it are removed, this hickory tree is eventually likely going to die. Um, if not, it'll be very, very unhealthy and won't be growing with much vigor and won't be productive um, from a timber perspective. From wildlife perspective, it's also not going to be very productive because the um, available sunlight to the crown of the tree is directly related to um, the nut production. So this hickory tree is not going to produce very many hickory nuts um, because it's not receiving much sunlight. Now that we have talked a little bit about um, some of the terminology and ideas in silviculture and forestry. We're going to talk about the five different silvicultural harvest methods that we can use um, as tools to achieve our goals. Um, they're split into two groups. So the first group is even age management, where all of the trees in the canopy are the same age. The second grouping is uneven age management. Um, uneven age management is more common on, on private land in Ohio, um, <clears throat> for better or worse. So that is where you're going to have trees of different age classes in your woods. So you're going to have, say, mature 80, 90 year old trees, and you're also going to have, say, 30 or 40 year old trees. Um, and, and it can be more than just two age classes. But I'm standing in a, a woods right now um, that is, is uneven aged. Um, now it has not been harvested in the past, so it's a little unusual that it would be uneven aged. Um, <clears throat> however, I believe this used to be pasture. Um, we've got a pretty big walnut tree right here. Um, of course, walnut's not a great pasture tree, but I suspect this was pasture. And then I spin around this way and you can kind of see the big cherry tree that we were standing at in the last segment back there. Um, we've also got, you know, there's a smaller walnut tree right there. There's a smaller cherry tree here. Um, we've got a little bit of hickory, some sugar maple in here also. So I believe what happened here was we had these large trees in the pasture and it was then um, allowed to revert back to woods. So we've got these dominant trees that, that uh, predate the woods essentially and then the rest of the woods is a younger age class. Um, however, if we are going to come out with a uneven age stand through a harvest, we're going to use um, one of two different harvests. Um, the most common is a single tree selection harvest. So that's where a forester goes through and selects um, individual trees throughout the stand that are going to be removed. Um, generally, we're going to be looking for trees with defects, um, trees that are maybe over mature, um, trees that are have met their financial maturity, um, trees that have been damaged, trees that are high risk. So we're going to remove um, our lower quality, poor quality, poorly formed trees. We're also going to remove some fully mature and over mature trees. Um, that are um, starting to decline or close to declining. Um, <clears throat> so that's a single tree selection method. So in here, I would probably mark that big walnut tree because it has quite a few defects. It's got some big knots where old branches were. Um, and also that black cherry we looked at a little bit ago, right here. Um, I'd remove that one too because it's poorly formed. Um, cherry trees tend to start to decline in this part of Ohio um, really before they get to that size. And so that's going to open up some sunlight for some of these other trees. I'd really like to get some additional sunlight to the crown of this smaller walnut tree that's, that's behind me right now um, because it's really a pretty nice tree that I would like to uh, grow to a, a much larger size. 
Um, <clears throat> the other type of uneven age management is a group selection harvest. So instead of going through and choosing individual trees, you're going to go through and choose um, groups of trees. So you're going to get a little more sunlight to the, the forest floor, um, whereas with the single tree selection, you're really maintaining the same canopy that you had before with some small gaps. Um, those gaps aren't going to be big enough to get um, shade intolerant species growing in them. It's mostly going to be shade tolerant species. In a group tree selection, um, depending on what trees you're removing and what um, sapling size trees you have, you're a little more likely to be able to um, grow some trees that require a little more sunlight. Um, so one example of a group tree selection, um, aspen tends to grow in stands or clones. Um, and so you might go in and have a quarter acre to a half acre that's just aspen trees. Um, aspen trees don't have a lot of timber value, and once they're over 15 feet or so, they've got very little wildlife value. Um, so if I can remove a half acre that's just aspen, I'm probably going to grow some more aspen trees that, that sprout from those stumps. Um, and those young aspen trees have a much greater wildlife value. Um, a lot of wildlife really love the buds on aspen. Uh, deer like them. Um, they're essential to a grouse's life cycle. Um, and also some other areas where we might do a group tree selection is in a bottomland area where we've got a lot of black walnut. Um, black walnut tends to grow in stands. It secretes a chemical called um, juglone that inhibits the growth of some other trees. Um, <clears throat> not all, but some. And so if we've got an area that's a lot of black walnut, we might go in and take out a half acre of it because black walnut requires full sun to, to regrow. Um, so if we want to regrow walnut, we're going to have to get a lot of sunlight to the ground. And honestly, a half acre is probably not going to be enough um, in general to get um, full sun um, or shade intolerant trees, you need to have at least an acre and a half cleared to get the proper amount of sunlight down to those uh, seedlings and saplings to really have them grow vigorously. Um, but yeah, that is the, or those are the uneven aged management techniques. So now that I have talked about the uneven aged timber harvest techniques, I'm going to talk about the harvest techniques to manage for an even-aged um, woodland. The part of the woods I'm standing in now is even-aged. Um, it's primarily made up of red maple. Um, there's a little bit of size variability in the trees, but they're all about the same age. There's also some sassafras in here that's all about the same size and same age. Um, there's also some dead ash trees that used to be the, the same age. Um, <clears throat> but just to kind of get a feel for, for what that looks like. The canopy is uh, pretty full. Um, there's not a lot of growing room in this particular woods. So of the three harvest um, timber harvests to achieve an even-aged forest, <coughs> excuse me, I'm going to um, talk about the most controversial one first, um, a clear cut. So the word clear cut has a lot of bad connotation um, attached to it. Um, and that's unfortunate because it is a silvicultural harvest method. Um, whenever you do a clear cut, you are not um, removing a forest, you're removing trees from the forest, you're changing the age of that forest, but it's still going to be a forest. Um, people tend to get clear cut mixed up with um, a land conversion. So if somebody takes a 10 acre woods and cuts down all the trees and grinds all the stumps or pops all the stumps out and burns it and turns it into a shopping center or a farm field, that's not a clear cut, that's a land conversion. Um, a clear cut, you still have a forest when you're done. It's just a much younger forest. Um, so a clear cut, you're going to go into a woods and you're going to cut all the trees down to about a two inch diameter. 
Um, and whenever you do that, you are achieving um, basically a clean slate. So you're then going to grow um, shade intolerant trees, um, stuff that needs full sun, yellow poplar, um, black walnut, red maple, um, black cherry a lot of times, hickory, you'll get some oaks. Um, oaks are kind of a tricky one. We'll talk about those a little bit more um, soon. But um, another reason you might do a clear cut, other than trying to gain those shade intolerant species, is if a woods has been abused in the past. Um, so if that woods has been high graded, high graded is a um, non silvicultural harvest method where um, someone goes in and cuts all of the good trees and leaves all of the poor quality, um, undesirable species, um, damaged trees, stuff like that. So if you've got a woods that has been high graded, a lot of times a forester is going to recommend a clear cut because you want to get rid of those poor quality trees um, because unless they are poor quality trees that are providing some wildlife benefit, um, there's not really much reason to grow them. Um, you'd be much better off um, clear cutting it and then making a decision on which trees you want to grow there or you can let it regenerate naturally. Um, you're generally going to end up with red maple and black cherry then. Um, a lot of times people will want to have an oak component after a clear cut. Um, if there weren't oak trees present, you're going to have to plant them because there was no seed source. Um, and, and that's fine. Um, you just, you get a little more say in, in the quality of trees and in the species composition um, if you do kind of start with that clean slate. Moving on from that, the next harvest method, um, silvicultural harvest method to come up with an even age stand is a seed tree method. Um, that is where you're cutting all of the trees down to one inch with the exception of five or more trees per acre that you're leaving there as a seed source. So if you do have a few um, big oak trees or hickory trees or um, poplar trees, depending on depending on what you want. Poplar probably isn't the best selection. You want to have um, trees with a pretty robust root system that are not going to be very susceptible to wind damage um, because you are opening the canopy up so much you're going to tend to get some wind throw in a seed tree method of harvest. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's seed tree harvest. And then the last one is um, really the best harvest method to regenerate oak. It's called a shelter wood harvest. Um, and it's a harvest that's going to take place two or, uh, in two or more harvests over a 10 to 15 year period of time. Um, initially, you're going to come in and you're going to kill a lot of the understory trees, um, the intermediate trees, the mid-story trees, um, saplings that are not species that you want. So maybe you're going to come in and um, kill the sugar maple and the beech to get them out of the way. And then your next step is going to be to remove many of the um, canopy trees. And the amount that you remove is, is dependent on your goals, but it's going to, it's going to remove a lot of trees. Um, not, not as many as a seed tree harvest. You're going to have more trees than that. And there are going to be trees that are the species that you want. Um, so essentially, if you're trying to grow white oak or chestnut oak, which are popular trees to grow in a shelter wood harvest, you're going to leave white oak and um, chestnut oak in the overstory. One, to reseed the area. Two, to provide a little bit of shade to slow down the growth of um, some of your um, completely shade intolerant trees you're likely still going to have to do a follow-up treatment to get rid of some of the red maple. Um, red maple is a very robust and vigorous tree that um, will tend to outcompete a lot of the oak species without some type of intervention. Traditionally, in the eastern United States, there would be periodic ground fires come through most woods. Um, I know that seems crazy because most of us in Ohio have probably never seen a uh, wildfire, 
but there would be periodic ground fires that would come through and they would top kill many of the young trees. Um, <clears throat> oak trees build up a lot of root reserves so they would bounce back quicker than the red maple um, and outcompete them. Um, so a lot of times we'll have to replicate that somehow. On private lands it's not likely that you're going to be able to use prescri prescribed fire in Ohio right now. Um, on public lands they use it quite a bit um, after their shelterwood harvests. And so <clears throat> after that follow-up treatment um, you want to get a lot of advanced regeneration, so pretty big um, saplings and small pole-sized timber. Um, and depending on growing conditions, that can take 10 to 15 years. But after you've got that regeneration, you're going to come back through and do a second harvest to remove those overstory trees that you left in the first harvest. Um, so essentially, for that 10 to 15 year period of time, you've got two age classes, but you're going to remove the older one and be left with an even age stand of hopefully an oak hickory forest. One aspect of forest management and silviculture that's changed a lot over the years is the impact and abundance of non-native invasive species. So a non-native invasive species is um, essentially any species that has not um, traditionally been found in a location. Um, so some examples are Alanthus or Tree of Heaven, um, privet, bush honeysuckle, autumn olive, burning bush, this multiflora rose that I'm standing in front of right now. And they tend to, to move into forest ecosystems or um, old fields, areas like that and really kind of um, take over. And oftentimes, especially in the case of privet and bush honeysuckle, they're very shade tolerant. So even a mature forest, they'll move in and really take over the area. And it's very difficult for native trees and shrubs to move up through um, that thicket of invasive species to be able to grow. Um, so I mentioned this is um, multiflora rose here. I'm gonna walk over this way and show you guys privet. Um, most of the invasive species in this woods have been controlled already. Here's privet. Um, unfortunately, these ones have not been yet. Um, the plan is this summer or early fall that they'll be um, cut down and then treated with a chemical to kill the root system. I'm gonna walk a little further into the woods and show you an example of a shrub that oftentimes um, gets displaced by um, bush honeysuckle and privet. It is a um, native shrub called spice bush. It's right here. Um, if you're in doubt if it's spice bush, take and crumple up a leaf, smell it, and it kind of has a spicy fruity smell to it. Um, this guy gets red berries on it. Um, looks similar to the red berries on bush honeysuckle. However, these berries are chocked full of nutrition and fat that are essential for uh, songbirds and other wildlife to survive. So um, we liken the, the fruits on things like autumn olive and bush honeysuckle and privet to junk food. So it, it's food, but they're empty calories. Um, whereas the berries on this spice bush are going to be a great source of nutrition that really kind of helps that wildlife either make its migration or make it through the winter. All right, I am now going to uh, leave this woods and we are going to go take a look at a woods that uh, I've made some silvicultural decisions in and there's going to be a single tree selection harvest happening soon. Um, so I'll see you over there. So we've talked about some of the different uh, silvicultural harvest methods that we have in our toolbox as foresters. And I'm going to show you how I implement uh, one of those on the ground in, in a woodlot. Um, so this particular woodlot is a beech maple woods primarily. There are other species, there's some white oak over there, but there's not enough of a white oak component um, to be able to regenerate white oak properly in this woods. So we are going to be using a single tree selection um, harvest method, which is going to regenerate shade tolerant species. You can see there's a lot of pole sized sugar maple behind me, um, and so those are our our future canopy trees eventually. 
Um, so I'm standing next to a tree that was left during the last harvest, um, which was done by a previous landowner who um, really had most of the good timber taken out of here. So this is going to be an improvement cut. We're utilizing a single tree selection harvest method as an improvement cut. So I determined that this tree was approximately 30 inch diameter, two logs. Um, it's kind of a misshapen tree, so it's difficult to estimate that, but that's, that's what I came up with. So I'm going to mark it for harvest, utilizing my orange tree marking paint. I'll try to get a good picture of this, but I'm going to put an orange ring, nice bright orange ring, all the way around this tree because I want it to be very conspicuous um, that this tree is included with the sale. Um, doing it with one hand is making it a longer process than normal. But there we go, we've completed the ring. And I'm also going to put an orange stump mark down there. Um, so that if there's any question, I can come back in the woods and see that that stump was from a tree that was marked. Um, so looking around, we're going to release a lot of sugar maple. There's a little hickory right there. By removing this tree, we're gonna manipulate the sunlight and get a lot more sunlight to the ground. Um, you can see a red maple right here that I'm also going to mark. Obviously a much smaller tree than this one, but one that I don't necessarily want to uh, spend a lot of sunlight growing. So a big part of forest management is deciding which trees you're going to leave in the woods um, while doing a harvest. So like I said earlier, we are doing an improvement cut essentially in this, in this woods. Um, so this tree is actually going to stay. It's a 24 inch white oak that's about two and a half logs tall of merchantable uh, timber. Um, I'll talk a little bit in the next segment about um, what this tree is worth now and what this tree will be worth in the future um, from a monetary standpoint. From a wildlife standpoint, this is the gold standard. Um, this is the most utilized tree in the woods by wildlife. Um, whether it be birds like blue jays or squirrels or white-tailed deer or wild turkey. Um, this woods doesn't have a big oak component right now, um, and it's not going to in the future either. Uh, the future of this woods is beech and maple. Um, there's very few scattered white oak throughout here. Um, so these guys are gonna stay for the sake of diversity and also to provide that valuable food source for, for our wildlife in the wintertime. So we just took a look at that white oak tree that was a 24 inch diameter that I decided to leave in the woods to create a food source for wildlife and also to add some diversity to the woods and also to get a little bit larger. Um, right now it is 24 inches at DBH, which is diameter at breast height or four and a half feet off the ground. Um, it's about two and a half logs tall. Um, so right now there's about 420 board feet in the tree. A board foot can be visualized as being one foot by one foot by one inch thick. So imagine a board that's one foot long, one foot wide, and one inch thick. There's 420 of those in that tree. Um, I'm going to give you some price information. Um, I'm going to use approximately what that tree was worth prior to the COVID-19 situation. Um, the markets were a little bit stronger then, um, and hopefully they'll return to that once this is all over. So I'm going to um, use $1.10 per board feet as the price that I assign to this tree. So at 24 inches, which is what it is now, um, that tree is worth about $462. Um, if we let it grow to be 26 inches, there will be 520 board feet in it and it'll be worth about $572. If it um, grows to be 28 inches diameter, there'll be 620 board feet in it, and right now it'd be worth um, $682 if it were that size, and at 30 inches, it would be worth about $814. Um, so just to recap, right now, it's about $462, and if it grows to be six inches um, larger in diameter, it will be worth $814. Um, 
So I just wanted to give you guys a little bit of insight into what that tree is worth. You make different decisions when you're near a stream than when you're not near a stream. Right now I'm standing in a small headwater stream. There's no water flowing in it, but after a storm there would be. There are little pools of water behind big rocks and in low areas. Those are places where salamanders and frogs like to hang out. There's a big sugar maple tree with a pretty big branch coming out low in the tree. And then there's a big beech tree with a pretty big canopy. These are both trees that if they were um, farther, farther up the slope, I'd probably mark for harvest. But since they're here, right on the stream bank, I'm going to leave them. They're doing a few things. They're helping hold the stream bank. They're also keeping a little bit of shade on the stream, which makes it more fair, favorable conditions for amphibians and other little critters. Um, so we're going to keep these trees. I'm on a property now that was harvested very recently. Um, they wrapped up the harvest about three weeks ago. And the area I'm standing in was a group tree selection. Um, we removed a lot of aspen from this area, big toothed aspen. Um, it was really beyond the point of productivity. We wanted to get some sunlight to the ground to help some new trees grow. Um, as I walk through here, you'll see a lot of tops down on the ground. That's perfectly normal after a timber harvest. Um, those tops are gonna turn into soil soon enough. And before they do, they're kind of helping prevent erosion. Um, any timber harvest, there's going to be soil disturbance, obviously. And so having those tops is going to slow down the rainfall and keep a lot of the soil in place. Um, so I mentioned there's a lot of sunlight here now. We've got a pretty good sized northern red oak right here. There's a hickory tree right there. We've also got some sugar maple and some red maple and some black cherry in this area. Um, all of these trees are going to provide seed. The uh, stumps from the aspen are going to re-sprout um, and the seeds from the other trees are going to sprout. Go ahead and show you. That's a pretty big canopy gap that we've got now. So the hope is that all of those trees are going to, or all of those seeds are going to sprout into small trees. And then the uh, landowner will come through and use um, mechanical and chemical means to get rid of some of the uh, black cherry and some of the red maple. Um, if there's much sugar maple, some of that also, because we really want to try to regenerate some northern red oak in this area from a few of these big red oak seed trees that we left. Um, not to be confused with the seed tree method, because this isn't. This is just a small area on the property where we're hoping to get some, some oak regeneration. I want to take a little bit of time to talk about um, the impacts of silvicultural timber harvests on wildlife. So I mentioned the uneven aged uh, management strategies earlier, single tree selection and group tree selection. Um, single tree selection, you're going to have, any timber harvest is going to have an impact on the wildlife in the short term. Um, a single tree selection is going to have the least amount of impact, um, really by the next growing season. Um, a lot of the wildlife species that were present there before are going to still be present. Um, they're going to be acclimated to the new conditions. In a group tree selection, um, <clears throat> you're gonna get a little more brush, a little bit more um, young um, woody vegetation. So you're going to uh, create some cover that'll provide some opportunities for um, you know, deer bedding and maybe some birds that don't necessarily like mature trees. Um, <clears throat> the bigger wildlife impact is going to come from your even age management. So a clear cut or a seed tree harvest or a shelter wood harvest. Um, because we're drastically changing the age class of the forest, um, <clears throat> it is going to really change the the composition of the wildlife species in that forest when you do a harvest like that. Um, and that's not a bad thing. Um, a lot of our wildlife species are in need of early successional habitat that we get from those even aged management strategies. So whenever you think about um, northern bobwhite, which um, we don't have a lot of around in Ohio, um, roughed grouse, um, white-eyed vireos, um, 
blue winged warblers, um, some stuff like that. You really, you need that early successional habitat and we don't have a lot of it right now. Um, so creating some of that habitat is really going to have a positive impact on a group of wildlife that uh, needs some help right now. Um, our mature forests provide um, habitat for a lot of great species, pileated woodpeckers, great horned owls, um, wild turkey, um, <coughs> red-eyed vireos, um, obviously a lot of squirrels, um, but the, there's a lot of that kind of habitat around. Um, so really, if we can create some more early successional habitat, whether that be through um, doing some even age timber harvests or by reverting some um, marginally productive fields and pastures back to woods, um, we're really gonna be doing those wildlife species a big favor. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. I hope that you've all learned something here at uh, virtual silviculture class here at virtual Camp Canopy 2020. Um, at traditional Camp Canopy, we uh, normally have a team of two or three um, foresters and wildlife biologists teaching each silviculture class, and it takes about three and a half hours. So I had to condense down a lot of information into a short amount of time. Um, if you've got questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, here on the Camp Canopy Facebook page, you can shoot us a message. Um, I'll also put up my contact information at the end of this um, if you guys have any, any questions. And uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of Virtual Camp Canopy 2020.